Greetings and welcome everyone to Linguistics and Pedagogy webinars. Today we are having a webinar with Ms. Ramya and the topic is very basic and I hope the new learners or the students uh, who are new to linguistics or the people who don't know about linguistics yet or even the people who know a lot about it may refresh their uh, memory with the basic definitions and basic introduction to linguistics and few of its branches. So before we start with that, uh, I would like to tell you a little about how this webinar will be conducted. So you have an idea that how the things will go and what you have to do. So the first and foremost thing is that you have to remain active and you have to watch the webinar from start to the end. All right. And this webinar first uh, in the, uh, this webinar has three parts. The first part uh, will be of the presentation. All right, and after that, we have a live Q&A session. Uh, you can uh, participate in the live Q&A session. You can give your questions in the comments uh, in the live chat. All right, you might be seeing a live chat option uh, under this video. If you click on it, you comment it, we can see it. And then during Q&A session, you can comment your questions in the live chat and we will be answering them. And Ms. Ramya will be answering them, all right? And after Q&A session, uh, I will be telling you how you get your certificate. All right. So first, I want to clear some things about the certificate um, and the eligibility criteria. All right. So uh, as we post about these webinars, we give a registration link. All right. The registration uh, link is not enough to get your certificate. You have to come and watch this webinar. And then in the end of this live webinar, we uh, give a link to uh, this uh, certificate. Uh, it's called a feedback form link and uh, when you click on that link you will be like redirected to a form you will have to put in your name and all the details and when you fill in confirm and submit it only then you will be eligible for the certificate all right and uh, later queries about how to get the certificate or anything i will be discussing uh, that uh, as well uh, in the end of this webinar all right when i will be telling you the whole process of uh, how to get your certificate so without further ado, uh, let's get started and welcome Ms. Ramya uh, to start her presentation and with her introduction. Thank you very much. Hello, ma'am. How are you? Hello, sir. Always some pretty good things. How do you do? I'm also doing great. So yeah, uh, we will begin. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, uh, having this webinar and sharing your knowledge with all the audience. And uh, before you start the presentation, uh, we would like yeah, to sure. know a little about you. So please start off with your introduction. Thank you. Very yeah, sure. First of all, I'm really glad to uh, be a part of this webinar. And thank you so much, Sir Abbas Rasamemin, for inviting me as a resource person to this international webinar on linguistics and pedagogy. It's indeed a great honor for me to be a part of this webinar, and uh, I can't wait to greet my audience and active participants who are indeed um, waiting patiently. So well, good day, everyone, and I hope all are doing great today. So their curiosity means um, a lot. So without further ado, let me just start presenting my screen, and we shall dive into that and introduce myself, by the way. So here we go. Today, it's a day where I'm not going to share my knowledge alone, but also I'm pretty sure I can learn from a lot of people who are from various parts of the world. So uh, now let me introduce myself. Allow me to do it. Yes, my name is Ramil. I'm from Anilgiri district, which is located in the southern part of India. And I'm currently pursuing my master's degree and I hold a bachelor's degree in English literature with gold medal. 
But from academics, um, I have a very interest in writing poems and have co-authored more than 100 plus anthologies so far and uh, received International Shakespeare Award and uh, at the same time, All India Best Writer Award. So that's it, a short intro about me. Now let's dive into a galaxy of uh, uh, linguistics because we explore more and more and that never ends. So now, um, before getting into that, let me ask you all a question. What is linguistics? So now for this question, I guess that everyone will tend to give me definition. Something seems like this, right? So yes, it's derived from the Latin word. And we know that it's a scientific study of language. And um, basically, when we say this, people are road learners. They just say a definition. But most of the people fail to understand the concept. And they're confused with the term what is linguistics and what is phonetics. So to get a clear, a clear idea about such things, today I'm gonna be dealing with various aspects of it and uh, the branches we're gonna speak about. So this linguistics, whether it's uh, about, we are learning about English alone, or we are learning about all the language which how we have in the various parts of the world. It's studying of all the human languages in general. But it's not only for English, but we learn human languages in general. That's what linguistics is. So now, we, whether we are well versed about this Latin word or a Latin language, but we again, we tend to say that linguistics is derived from Latin word. So let's have a look at, at in this next slide. That is what it's split up into linguistics. Uh, that is the linguistics is a word which is split up into lingua anastics where lingua is a Latin word, which is uh, representing to tell us an organ resembling tongue. And we know that tongue plays an important role, an uh, important speech organ. But apart from that, we have a lot and lot of speech organs. But um, we tend to say that the relating organ, this tongue, is very important, uh, whereas to articulate and for pronunciation, that seems very important organ. Otherwise, we cannot speak or articulate a proper sound of the word. And now coming to istics. So this is knowledge or science, as you can see in the slide. So compressing together, splitting words, we know the background of linguistics, how it's got the name, the scientific term. So this is a similar manner. We'll have a lot of branches in linguistics. Today, we're going to especially learn about five things, which is very interesting. And uh, We'll, uh, as, uh, as Avaisar said, we'll be very much familiar with linguistics, but people tend to learn, maybe it's an undergrad student of linguistics. They just learn a, a definition, a set of definitions, and they're uh, always, they mess it up and get confused. So if you learn, uh, if it is derived from Latin word, how the word is split up, how are all the scientific term linguistic is split up. If you learn this, you're never gonna get confused. And even in your dream can answer, but what, branch is what? So now we will skip on to the next slide, which is branches of linguistics. We have five major and more than that, but today we're going to discuss about phonology, phonetics, morphology, and at the same time, semantics and syntax. So now for pronunciation, we need two important fields, which is uh, phonology and phonetics, as you can see in the slide here. All right, so for the study of pronunciation, we need two important fields that we have to be very, um, we have to get more knowledge in depth ab about that. So then only we can be able to pronounce the word in the right manner. So what is phonology? Actually, this is also a scientific study. And we know that um, in human speech, the sounds plays an important role. So how do we say a human uh, speech starts with a sound? Do you know why? Because in ancient age or be it a stone age, people tend to imitate sounds from uh, nature. And that's how it just evolved in uh, as years and decades passed by. That's how the human language evolved. So phonology is dealing with the speech sound and we're going to study about its uh, communicative purposes. So that is what uh, phonology is. On the other hand, we have phonetics, which is also dealing with the study of pronunciation. So now for phonetics, it's also a study of a speech sound, 
But you know, what is speciality about it? We are going to learn about the articulatory and from acoustic point of view. So articulatory and acoustic point of view, we have a lot and lot of systems which to be learned starting from respiratory and um, other kind of systems like a phonatory system, which will include all of your throat and the parts there. Maybe it's like a vocal cord or maybe it's a glottis and epiglottis, a lot of organs. And in phonetics itself, we learn about all the articulatory regions, including your upper jaw, lower jaw, and important organ tongue for your overall uh, pronunciation to be developed. You will have to follow these systems uh, for a better understanding of phonetics and uh, phonology. Now, coming to phonology. So what is this phonology? It is a pattern of sound. So I have a lot of set of questions to all my active participants here. Actually, there are uh, they are the pattern of sounds of phonology. Uh, so, for example, I have a list of the three important uh, words you can see in the slide: pay, bay, and eBay. So for this, now if I ask you a question, the B sound, which is a B consonant, the sound in bay, as you can see here in the bay, is more similar to Pay or eBay? Can I have some answers in the live chat? This pay is more similar to, sorry, the bay is more similar to pay or eBay. Because if you are determining it by, like for bay and eBay, if you're determining like that, the, by seeing the consonant in the uh, bay, the B, and the consonant in B, that is eBay, if you determine like that or in a print your answers like that, that's not going to be right because for pay, when you transcribe a word, you can get to know that um, a kind of aspirated head sound, a kind of puff comes out of your mouth. So this is how you learn sound. If you learn sound in an accurate manner, then even if you are a second language speaker or um, now English is not your mother tongue, surely we'll able to uh, cope up with that because sounds plays an important role. If you understand sound in a better way, you'll be able to excuse the words and then pronounce it very efficiently. So now for, as I asked you all the question, this pay, a bay, is very similar to the first pay because while transcribing, you will have aspirated sound, a kind of puff sound coming out of released by this pay. So if you are in any of their location, you can sit and just pronounce and see pay. And we say bay and eBay. Okay, so we can say that eBay by seeing a word alone, we can say it is similar. By seeing bay and eBay, we can say they pronounce similar, but the sound pattern in that differs. So that is what phonology is. And now we'll go to the next slide. Phonetics. So, so far we learned about uh, phonology. Um, we uh, learned how patterns of sound is very important. So people just determining uh, by seeing a consonant or maybe by seeing just a word you can pronounce. For example, I would say psychology. So when you take this, the friend, uh, we have the consonant, which is a P actually, but we don't, we maintain them as a silent and say psychology. So these can be learned better with the uh, phonetics by putting the right sound in the right place. And uh, people of uh, native speakers often drop the sound T and D. So this is how and uh, the assimilation process occurs in the language. So next is the phonetics, which we were, uh, next we are going to deal with, which means the properties of sound. Phonology is pattern of sound, whereas phonetics is properties of sound. So what is this? How they are made? First of all, I told you, if you are well versed with uh, pronouncing the sounds, pretty sure you can also go forward with the next process, which is how they are made. So I told you earlier, the imitation of sounds came from nature, be it onomatopoeia words or like a buzzing sound, a uh, hissing. So like this, a lot of uh, words came uh, imitated by human from nature. So when it's like that, how they are made, it's like there will be a set of rules. You have to follow them and then how they, each sounds are made and how they are heard. So even just if you hear some words, sometimes we can understand native speakers because 
the hearing from acoustic point of view is also mattering the most. So how they are made, we are going to see these are the properties of sound and how they are transmitted is very important. So how you transmit well, the more you transmit well, the better you hear and the better you, you are able to pronounce the word. And now in phonetics, we refer to individual sound. We don't say alphabet as we pronounce alphabets like A, B, C. But here in phonetics, it's like in the pattern of sound where you use, for example, which we'll see in the next slide. And um, uh, now we will be confused with phonetics uh, where it comes like phones, and uh, halophones, like the sum of the important terms. Now, here we have phones, the very first line of my slide, like in phonetics, we refer to individual sounds as phones or sound, but we don't pronounce them as the letters. H as it is the letter of a consonant is, we don't do like that. But we, uh, indeed, we say it is a sound and the unit of each sound is known as phoneme. So you don't get confused with what is phone and what is uh, phoneme. Actually, the unit of certain sound which we make or which we imitate and transmit is known as phonemes. And um, these phonemes are of uh, various sounds. In English, we have 44 sounds out of which uh, uh, we know 24 consonants and we have 20 vowels. And uh, when you ask up to, before you go to undergrad of uh, linguistics or something, when a professor asks you, how many sounds do we have? We, uh, like, well, how many sounds do we have in the wobble? We tend to say they are five, but actually when you get deeply into linguistics and learn, you will get to know there are 20 wobbles and um, very importantly, 12 are pure wobbles and uh, eight are dead tongues. So in such a way that we'll discuss about in the next slide, which is voiceless and voiced consonant. So for voiced and voiceless consonant, I, I told you already it is 24 consonants in English word, English sounds. So in a voiced consonant, they are produced when vocal cords are vibrating. So when you shut a door in your home, you will get a voice. Same as well, the voice box. Also, when it is um, closed, then it will start vibrating here or else there are also sounds which are voiceless. I'm talking about the consonants now. So which is related with the phonetics. So here we have voiceless sounds, which will be a wider part. Your vocal cords don't shut in order. It will be like wider part. It release a sound in a very soft manner so that it's a voiceless. So now you can get to know what is voiced and voiceless consonants. So voiced consonants are produced when the vocal cords are vibrating, as you can uh, put your hands here near to your throat. So I want you all to pronounce this word S M Z. So this is a pattern of sound where for zip, we don't vibrate actually, do we? No. So for zip, indeed, we have some sort of vibration here. So when you do this vibration correctly and where it should vibrate and where the vocal cords must not, you will get to know um, more important efficient pronunciation and that will be very good one. Now T and D for this, 10 and 10. For which our vocal cord vibrates is for den, but not for 10. And also uh, stop pronouncing the word where, where you are. I can't hear you, but you can just practice of telling pin and pin. For pin, we don't. We just release a puff of air, but for bin, we do. So before that, I thought of telling you things uh, in this slide, which is pay, bay, and ebay. So I talked about phonology, right? So for this pay, bay, ebay, we aspirate here and we say pay is similar to that of bay, but not for ebay. So in this English language, B and B are like some words similar, I would say. We hardly hear the difference between the P and B, but for Korean kind of languages, the B sound and B sound are really something kind of very variations. We can hear the variations, I, I assume. And uh, for Arabic speakers, they are very much um, uh, easy to, for them, it's easy to pronounce the word B, but they are struggling with B. So this is uh, in some of the scientific research we get to know. And when you talk about this Bay and Bay, eBay, so this is kind of example where uh, P, when you pronounce 
B sound in uh, like that sound. Particular that sound is something which you uh, pronounce in your word with, uh, without any um, vibration. Now, actually, B is a voiceless consonant, right? So when you pronounce that, when you whisper the particular B sound, you will indeed get this. Uh, you will tend to discover this kind of P sound. So that is what I thought of telling you here. So that P and B become similar, but not E B. And uh, now, coming to morphology, a very interesting topic um, in our branches of linguistics, because without morphology, there won't be a structure of words. And uh, structure of words is very important, where you can see the birds and pets as an example have given here. So when you simply say a bird in the first block, you can see simply I just say a bird, it will be uh, in a singular form. And simply if you say pet, that will be also in a singular form. But heading for this consonant, when you add this consonant, how do you get to know that it's a plural? And uh, as you can see here, this S sound added to the bird gives you birds, which is in a plural. And for this pet in the first block, uh, when you have this S, you get pets. But you know the difference here, the same consonant sound is going to give you different sound at the end, the pronunciation sound. Now for morphology, it is a structure of word. Bird is one morpheme and S is one morpheme. Do we have S? Um, do we have any meaning for S? But when this a small consonant S is added to bird, it becomes birds, becomes plural. And same similar thing happens with this pet. When you add this S, it becomes pets. So this is how the sound. And I mentioned for birds, you are having Z sound at the end, where which means you're vibrating at the end. But for pets, it's not the case. So we will look at that. We'll look at that very detailly in the next slide. Now, talking about this word, um, word in language is consisting of um, one or more elements, as I showed you earlier. Bird is a bird, which is a having uh, one or more element, which is bird plus S. -S. So same as well here also in morphology, we have uh, more than one element, which is forming uh, new, new elements of words. So this is how evolution occurred. So when you talk about history of English literature, you will have old English, middle and modern English. So language isn't always constant, but it takes evolution. So that is very important thing. Now, words in a language is consisting of one element or more elements. So each time when this element is added, you will find new words. So for such example, have taken establish, which is a, indeed a word. Is it or not? It's a word. So when you had this and um, uh, like meant, which is meaningless, actually meant has don't it meant has no any meaning for it. But when it is added as a suffix, um, you can uh, say that establishment is turning into noun. So this is how a word play occurs in uh, most of the English uh, words. And when you talk about this um, element, each element established and meant. So this established is one morphine and meant is another morphine. So when you put together the both two morphines, you will get to know uh, uh, you will get to know the new word and you will also discover a new word, which is uh, establishment here, for example, which is a noun. And uh, coming to the next slide, we get to know about semantics. So all these terms are very uh, easier to learn unless you detailly analyze them because people tend to learn the definitions as I told you already and uh, they are often uh, confused with this so when you talk about semantics it is very important because it is a uh, end of a structure it is an end of uh, a particular uh, form so when you talk about the semantics it is a meaning of language so why do we say it is a meaning of language we saw about the phonology and phonetics which is initial point of a sound and next, we get to know about um, morphology, how the word structure is formed, words, right? So with that word, we are forming some meaning. So if you speak and it, if it is meaningless, none can understand. Same as well, the meaning of language matters most. So that is what we study in semantics. 
So how meaning is constructed? So this is the first question. How the meaning is constructed matters most. Um, so now we had morphine. So for meant, we don't have any meaning. But when you put together, it gives you a noun. So same as well, the meaning construction is very important unless you are uh, not meaningful with the sentence, then none can understand you and how it's clarified. So semantics, with the help of semantics, we can clarify the things. We can clarify a phrase or maybe it is a, a sentence you can clarify. So that's how your meaning of a language evolves. And next is how meaning is interpreted. So interpretation of meaning is very important. So this we learn in reader response theory. So if you give a novel to a person and uh, if it turns uh, pages, so each will interpret that title or a book in different manner, which also leads to deconstruction uh, term in English. So how the meaning is interpreted is it differs to each one's perspective. Now you'll be saying in one perspective, but you, uh, the same thing will be not in the uh, perspective of the other person. So that is how the semantics is related with these three questions. And meaning is a central study of communication. So you have to um, know the meaning. So that is what if you communicate, you wanted to communicate because you want to share a lot of things to the people. You have to uh, share your emotions. So for this, we have communication as a medium so that people can understand. Now, by sitting in various parts of the world, you're listening to this webinar. This is also a kind of communication where you you understand the meaning but unless you understand the meaning then it's not usable right so same as well here semantics is very important uh, for defining a meaning of a language if you do not give any kind of meaning for the language then it does not worth it so when you talk about linguistics um, the very important concept comes here be it a sound you can mistake with a sound but you learn again and again. But uh, also for this word, you may be not able to put a word in one place, but you are again and again, you are making some, some kind of mistakes. And that is also doesn't matter. But after all this learning at a certain point where you have to give meaning for a language, that is how the semantics help with us. But, you know, a very interesting thing about semantic is uh, like it is a semantic ambiguity we get to know, which is this. So for uh, ambiguity, what is ambiguity? It is like uh, more than one interpretation, which will give you a confusion, a confused state of mind. So for this, it exists when a word form corresponds from one to one, uh, one or more meaning. So if you have one meaning and you are interpreting more and more, so that will lead to a confusion. Now, for example, I have semantic ambiguity. Uh, there is a sentence. You can look at my slide right here. I bought a pen. So can I have um, answers for this? What I mean actually by this example? I bought a pen is um, like, you know, I bought a pen is a sentence where I'm not describing anything apart from this. But, you know, actually, you all will tend to know I bought a pen is uh, I bought a pen, which is a writing pen, maybe like the kind of this pen. But, you know, what I really meant is in the next slide. So I didn't mean this pen. Actually, I meant this this kind of pen where dogs are got it in a way like something which we tend not to make it escape from any other place and it will be aware of pets um, can be in a contained position so i can also say i bought this pen for a dog for my dog to play with so one word as a two meaning where you can see this pen is not what actually i meant so uh, henceforth, the word pen here represents two different meaning, which is leading to a semantic ambiguity. And uh, we can say that for when we come to learn about semantic ambiguity, we are continuing with the process of words which have similar meaning. For example, a homophone. Homophone is also dealing with some meaning and heterophone a homonym, homograph, and etrograph, so etronym. So these are the five important terms uh, of what we learn. Uh, actually, homophone, etrograph, um, uh, like most of the things, we are already familiar from our schoolings. And uh, 
when we talk about in detail, homophone and heterograph are similar. Because why, you know, they have the same pronunciation, but different meaning. This homophone has the same pronunciation and have a different meaning. Can you uh, give me an example in the chat box? Like, oh, which will have the same pronunciation, any word. It can be the same pronunciation, but a different kind of meaning. So, for example, sun, uh, S-U-N and S-O-N, which we'll be seeing, uh, seeing later on in some of the slides. So, sun and sun. I can mean also the, which is a rising sun, or I can also mean a uh, son who is a male descendant, right? So, it has the same pronunciation, but different meaning. And when you talk about etrograph, it has the same pronunciation, but different meaning without a full spelling. Yeah, peace is a very good example. And um, when you talk about heterograph, we have two, uh, like uh, what I'm coming to tell is also leads to ambiguity, actually. Two, uh, T double O is, yeah, me too. We say me too. But another two is number two. So this is heterograph. So we can combine, so as I showed you, these five, in this five, we can see homophone and etrograph in a similar manner. They are, um, of course, they are identical. And talking about this homonym, they have the same kind of pronunciation, same spelling, but they are different in meaning. So for example, have given well. So can you construct any sentence with this well? I'm doing well. We can say also, I built a well and a constructed well near to my home to fetch water. So it can also mean that. And can I expect any other uh, construction of sentence from audience side for well? Yes, bank and bank here, yeah, good, pretty good. So now I'm talking about well, can you construct soon a sentence? with this well, which will have two different meaning, but you are having same pronunciation for well, you have to notice, and same spelling. At the same time, the meaning comes different. So understanding meaning in a language will lead to semantics. The water in the well is drying, all right? Yeah, that's pretty good. So thank you for your messages in the chat box. And now well, we have another well, which is I'm doing well, or some of these sentences like that we can get. And now coming to the kind, I'm well today, yes. Mohammed is very well today. All right, and now kind. We have kind where, um, as this is kind, these are the five kinds of literary device where uh, most of the authors use homophones, homograph, and heteronym. So such kind of terms are used by uh, authors for uh, like uh, great authors like William Shakespeare, they use pun in their language uh, of writing. So to write play and to write poetries, they use this kind of uh, words in order it makes a laugh from the audience as well when the play is conducted or we will you go through the poems and you are very much um, interested in learning. And suddenly when you see a two kind of word, say like kind and kind, I can say, Yes, everyone are kind to me. She has a kind art. Yes, that's pretty good. She has a kind art, we say. But at the same time, I can say there are five kinds of literary devices as well. And talking about match. So in schoolings, we have match the following. And that's also a kind. And another match is Olympics. Can you construct a sentence with match? Match as a, as a two different meaning of or what we interpret. Actually, I would say one thing, and people, on the other hand, can understand in different manners. So this is how the semantic ambiguity arises. Most of the ambiguity are um, used with that of a metaphor, or maybe in the poetry, uh, or some kind of novel, which will make uh, invoke a humor, indeed. Now, coming to, we played match today. All right, so, yes, that's also a kind of... Uh, example. So we thank you very much for your, your kind of very good examples from the audience side. And now for homograph and etronym, these both are similar. I can say it's a similar because uh, it has the same spelling but different meaning. 
it will have a same spelling and different meaning. And for heteronym, it is also having a same spelling, but you know, the different pronunciation and different meaning. So why this occurs? These two are identical. And uh, the previous one, which we saw is right here. Let me show you. Yeah, homophone and heterograph is also identical. The one thing here is it has different meaning. Also, this has different meaning. But for heterograph, we have different spelling, though. And when you talk about homonym, I have given certain examples and audience yeah, and active participants with enthusiasm. You have uh, constructed a sentence where you're going to recall once again uh, all of uh, the things which you learned for year. And homograph and heteronym also plays an important role where most probably we are familiar with a homonym and homograph, but we tend to uh, not, um, but we tend to confuse them. And for heteronym, it's maybe for a few people, it's new to hear. It has the same spelling, but different pronunciation and meaning. So for this, I can give you an example for homograph, bow. All right. So which we'll see later in a image. Bow is an example. It has three different meanings. Can you comment on the live chat? What are the three different meanings we have with bow? B-O-W. So we have three different meanings in it. Bow. So we can mention that in the comment as well, or oh, sorry, the live chat. And heteronym has the same spelling, but different pronunciation and meaning. So for this, we have different pronunciation meaning. I can tell you the word project, all right? So project has uh, the same spelling. It has different pronunciation and meaning. When I say I have project at my college, it is like a kind of task or uh, uh, my, a uh, manager has given a project to handle in a company, in an MNC company. So that is something, a task which is uh, allotted for you. But when I say project, the pronunciation differs from project to project. For, so project, we are stressing at the end, project, which is you are showing a movie or you're going to show something to some person, which is projecting. So this is how. So. I didn't get answer for bow. What are the three different meaning with bow? Giving respect. Yes, that's a great thing. And um, another, some kind of Asian countries and also uh, like uh, Chinese and Japanese, they bow and uh, welcome. Also, we greet our teachers and professors. We bow our head and another bow, yeah, bend and kind of ribbon. Very good. And one more bow we have. May I tell you? That is bow and arrow, which we often confuse, bow and arrow. So these are the three important meanings. And talking about heteronym, it has the same spelling, but a different pronunciation and meaning, as I told you, project and project. Now, yes, this is what um, uh, from audience we get to know this. Some mentioned it is this bow and some mentioned the second bow, which is giving respect. We duly pay respect to the people by bowing. And then another one is a bow and arrow. So now here is an example. Here is example sentence, let me tell you. Um, a young lady, all right, a, a young lady uh, gave a formal bow um, and presented gift as a bow. All right, so yeah, young lady uh, gave a formal bow and presented gift as a bow. Sorry, a bow as a gift. So in certain cases, the gifted bow by a young lady, you may interpret this one, the first picture, and you may interpret also the kind of bow and arrow. But when I say to you clearly that a young lady uh, gave a formal bow and presented the bow as a gift, one to a pretty girl, another to a hunter. So now you can understand to whom uh, the bow is given and what is the difference in this so this is how it helps us and next one is mouse so often we are like um, we will be able to uh, make a students of uh, to, uh, like we, who are pursuing the schoolings we can make them laugh by this by telling mouse and mouse so people get confused with this I can tell you an example sentence a mouse is lurking around my mouse on the desk so a mouse, this mouse, the first rodent, which is a rodent, is lurking around the mouse, that is the electronic device, in, on my desk. So a mouse is lurking around the mouse on my desk is something 
very like you know complicated but when you analyze detailly you will get into a little humorous situation and this sun so sun and sun which is a homonym i give you already you can see look at the picture that um, this sun is not similar to this we have pronunciation difference but when we tend to speak and while here we when we hear we often misinterpret which son you're referring to. So this man's son, his son likes to work under the sun. So if you say like this, the sentence, it will also lead to a semantic ambiguity. So, so far we learned so many things regarding ambiguity and uh, it was a kind of humorous situation where it leads to. So you have to be very, uh, uh, like very minute in which place you wrote or uh, use the correct sentence and which place you use uh, and you get confused. So if you are thorough with all this, then sure, it's uh, very easier to pronounce the word. It's very easier for other people to understand you efficiently. So uh, falling from the phonetics, from phonology, and then you have morphology, also semantics. So these all, when you line up together, linguistics research and research in any area of this branches becomes very easier for you all and becomes very efficient. And uh, now is our last slide, which is uh, syntax. So this is how the structure of language is. Structure of language uh, matters most. Where you can see, um, I have given you an example in a slide, I hit the ball. So often we are also familiar with the sentence pattern. We are going to recall once again, where I is a subject, hit is a verb, and the ball is an object. So for this sentence, you have subject, verb, and an object. So we know in most of the cases with most of the language, it is not similar. Now, yes, for example, you are a translator. All my enthusiastic participants presented today are translators. So uh, you are given a book or you are given a novel and you are asked to translate by uh, some other person or some other author. So what are you going to do? Whether you're going to translate as such it is in the particular book or you're going to refer the old meaning and then translate according to you according to that. So she likes three is the sentence what we have here. It can be also uh, differently and the particular words which we put, it can be in uh, not a, every time same in the subject place or the verb or the object. According to language, this sentence pattern also do change. So for SVO, this is one kind of sentence. We have a lot of patterns, but today we have taken only the three patterns. So where SVO itself is interchanged for subject, verb, and object, we have she likes three. So EMR for English language. Of course, the sentence pattern will be subject, verb, object. But for Mandarin Chinese, it is also similar, subject, verb, object. For Russian kind of languages, which I mentioned in the short SEMR, for English, Mandarin, and Russian kind of languages, you will have the same sentence pattern like S, V, O, T, like three, will be similar when you see Russian also says in the same sentence pattern, but their language will be different. All right, so this is one kind of set. And another when you talk S, O, V. So in S, O, V, we have she, three lights, but when you interpret this in an English, Surely there will be no meaning and you tend to blink, All right? So same as well, she, three likes, this sentence pattern is carried in other different languages, be it a Japanese language, be it a Latin and Tamil, which is a Dravidian language. So for all these three language, most probably the sentence construction will be S-O-V. And finally, we have likes, she, three. So we don't usually use this pattern in English, but for Hebrew and Italian kind of languages, there is verb in the first and then they use the subject and then object. Now, uh, as I told you, she likes three is similar in English at the same time for Chinese kind of languages, but certainly it differs uh, as I'm telling you like, um, uh, how are you or are you good? So in certain cases, are you good? So we attach some questions. Now, what is your name? We attach the question for English in the first 
right? What is your name? We attach the question uh, in the middle, uh, like, sorry, in the front, that is what. But for um, Chinese, which is a tonal language, there will be a question which is attached at the end of a question, uh, at the end of an interrogative question. So this is how the language language pattern or the structure of a language completely differs. And um, when you talk about this sentence structure, uh, you have to know the meaning and then alone you can construct a, a sentence in a better way. So uh, that's it. So we are at the verge of um, our presentation. Now, I want to say you a familiar card to everyone, which is a language disguises a thought. Each and every people thought are very creative and they're very unique. But uh, your thought is what will disguise your language. So I hope that everyone will use that language in an appropriate manner and uh, tend to do many research and uh, get to see many those who participated here as, um, uh, just as a participant and to get to know more on the areas of uh, linguistics. You have come with a lot of enthusiasm. I hope that there will be many linguists and phoneticians in the future. So language disguises the thought by saying this, I uh, like. I'm very glad to tell you all a very best wishes to you all, and thank you so much for uh, watching and uh, waiting so much patiently. And with a lot of things, um, you have given your kind cooperation in uh, messaging uh, in the chat, live chat, your thoughts and ideas. So that is how your thought also disguises your own language. So each language is unique. We can make a lot of study of human languages in general via linguistics, but we have to know the sound pattern, which is phonology, and uh, we have to know the phonetics, which are the organs, uh, which is um, are related in that field. And at the same time, morphology, which is dealing with word and how by applying the term morphology, we can get new words in the future where the language is not always constant, but it takes its own evolution. All right. So when you refer to the textbook of um, Anglo-Saxon, that is not similar of what we read today in English novels. So there are a lot of differences. I hope such differences will be only possible and the studies and research are possible when you understand the basic concepts like this and get on towards. So if you have further queries, you can write me at a given context which I have given. So thank you everyone once again for uh, waiting and watching patiently until now. Thank you. All right. Also, thank you, Ms. Ramya, for the wonderful presentation and clearly and comprehensively discussing every uh, topic. And it was very wonderful to hear from you. Thank you very much. So now we will be moving towards the Q&A session. So yeah, sure. uh, the audience, uh, please, if you have any questions uh, for Ms. Ramya uh, about the topic, then you can uh, comment your question in the live chat. So for the live chat, I want to also tell uh, one thing more that if you cannot uh, see the live chat for some reason then make sure you are logged into your gmail account first and if you are watching uh, through your laptop or your pc then make sure you uh, watch this webinar through youtube.com uh, the website itself not from any third party for example when you receive uh, an email uh, for the link of the webinar the video opens in the gmail itself a little screen so make sure you are not watching in that and watching on the youtube and if you are using your mobile phone then make sure you open your youtube app and you are logged into your gmail account then you will be able to see the live chat all right so now please uh share your questions with us all right so we have our first question here on the screen so linguistics is um, about only sounds. Actually, I told you already that um, linguistics is not only describing about sounds, but I would say that um, the first and foremost thing to learn a language will be a sound because uh, when we do not have language, now we are communicating efficiently with a certain language of what we know, be it a mother tongue or English, which is an international language. But in olden days, uh, we imitated a sound. All right. So from that part, uh, so that is a linguistic is only a sound. First, you have to understand the sound. Now, a person like uh, Adolf Somro is a person who asked the question. Okay, so you are going to learn Chinese language. 
So immediately you can learn a language very soon. First, you have to know the uh, sound pattern of the particular language, and then you have to know the word formation. And then finally, too, you will interpret a sentence and day by day you will become very fluent in particular language. So similarly, linguistics is not only dealing with the sound, but I would say that it's a main uh, center to learn sound and then move on towards uh, the scientific study of uh, other languages. So that's the question, uh, that's the answer I can give for this question. All right, very well answered. Uh, so now we will move to another question. Uh, that is, how easy can, how, um, how can we teach students how to disambiguate sentences easily? Yeah, that is how I went deeply through homophone and uh, Acronym. So first you teach them which are the words, like for example, for homonym, you have uh, the same uh, particular spelling, but you pronounce it a different, uh, you have to pronounce it differently in certain cases for acronym. But for homonym, it's not the case. You will pronounce it samely. So you can teach with the basics. All of a sudden, you can tell a student about uh, what is ambiguity and they'll be really confused with. So that better, it's to go with one by one, like line by line, as I went with uh, five important literary devices, actually it is homonym, etrophone, uh, and etronym, and certain kind. So when you detail go line by line and which is similar and which is not similar, which can be pronounced differently. So if you teach students in such a manner, they will easily understand. Now you can know what is bow, whether it's a homograph or homonym. And you can know sun, which is whether it is a homonym or homograph. So when you treat them with this, like when you uh, evolutionally, when you go and tell them like ambiguity, nobody will understand. So for that, you have to uh, teach the students in the better way, like to learn the linguistics in the better way by combining all these literary devices together, and then you can let them know, and they will be easily able to find out which is a homonym, etronym, so they will avoid this ambiguity. And uh, we don't say that uh, rodent mouse as a device mouse, we don't actually. So in the same manner, for the setting sun, you don't say get up early sun, you don't say your male descendant as get up early sun, because it will be already rising in the east. So these are the things, So by the way, can uh, avoid uh, disam like ambiguity. So you can disambiguate uh, the student in a better way and teach them. All right, so this was uh, more of regarding a teacher, what the teacher can do. So now yes. we have another similar question, but with a, a little different that how a person himself can like uh, ignore uh, or not ignore, but to like uh, easily understand this uh, semantic ambiguity misunderstanding what's practical way to avoid this so that is how now very good question so by albert so now we uh, as she has a non-native speaker of particular language to avoid this problem so uh, now when you come with the sounds you will um, avoid the uh, mistaking mis mistakening of sound so when you pronounce a particular uh, sound now for in English word, as I told you already, ta and ta sounds, which is different. We say today, we don't say today, but we say today. So same as well, if the pronunciation of the sound matters first, and then when you go for a word, uh, you have now if you really want to learn some other language, first of all, you will refer to only a small word so that you can avoid the disam like um, Again, this ambiguate the as so a person asked already the question. So how this is possible? So now, in case you don't know English, and uh, that is why, or that is why you are learning uh, some of the important aspects of uh, linguistics. So if you don't know the language, and uh, now you are non-native speaker, first of all, we don't jump into speaking that language. First, we will know the basics. Same as well for a non-native speaker, um, you will understand only the basic. Now, we, I, I won't use, or anybody in the audience side, you don't use uh, the ambiguity languages in a uh, different place because you know which word is which and uh, where you want to utilize that word. So appropriately, you will use. So as she asked, non-native speakers tend to uh, disambiguate a sentence. Uh, I think that they have the uh, least... Um, thing of idea which they can know from that word. That's what I could say because now we have mouse. 
so we know the difference. And for some, we know the difference. For some other language which we are not familiar, first we have to learn that, and then that's how we can avoid the ambiguity. Because learning is a lifelong process. We learn a lot. So by learning alone, the better understanding comes so that you can disambiguate, even if you are not a, a native speaker. All right. So I hope it's clear for Albert now. Now we will move to another question. Uh, Right. Linguistics and applied linguistics. So a very good question by Nasib. Uh, linguistics is a term that is you are uh, making a scientific study of a human languages in general, but not for a specific language. For applied linguistics, uh, you are going to apply some of the important terms uh, which you have to research in order so it's not only for applied linguistics you have a lot of linguistics like social linguistics and uh, according to that particular as um, already uh, we have a question right like um nasib she i have uh, has sorry not nasib before that um person asked a question uh, that is how a non-native speaker can avoid uh, this ambiguity in a particular way so same as well uh, applied linguistics is the same where a person wants to apply in, and study it in the better way where uh, you can relate some of the important things uh, apart from uh, this uh, like when you apply and study anything that will be a very possible thing where you can learn at a very good extent and uh, even if you are not very much familiar with that language or if you are a non-native speaker and through ap applied linguistics you can study it but for Linguistics, it's basically you learn a lot of language. Now, if I do research in the area of English, maybe uh, audience side, you can do any Japanese or Chinese, Korean kind of languages, but I'm not familiar with that. But when you take applied linguistics, you will apply of what you have to learn. And you will also initiate for uh, if it is a non-native speaker, you know, what are the uh, struggles they are having with understanding natives? So that is how you apply a certain thing and study and that how the results come out perfectly i guess all right thank you very much for this answer as well uh yes. now we have the question can i use yeah. my yeah. language in any age yes uh, that's a poor depend upon your curiosity in learning that language because nothing is impossible uh we can learn any language uh at an, any age age is uh, just a number I can say because um, apart from age, people do a lot of things in this world and achieve a lot of things. So for understanding now, uh, for example, if uh, there is a child or newborn, okay, who is um, uh, actually a native speaker in English, huh? you can guess like that. So if you leave that particular newborn child in a country where there is no English, you can see the difference how a child speaks right she will be uh, automatically adapted to that country and that culture and that language so this happens with newborns but if you are adult and you have curiosity to learn any kind of languages age is not a limit for that you can go ahead to learn a language uh all right i hope uh Vishnu Chaudhary is now more clear about it that you can learn language at an any age but if you are older then it pretty much depends on your interest and if you are very yes. young then it's an automatic process all right so now we have a um, much popular question in linguistics that is how can we avoid the influence of mother tongue interference yes. all right so this is also a very kind of good question so how to avoid influence of mother tongue in a friends is um, like most of the people feel difficult and um, this is uh, what I thought because we are as I started told already we are familiar with what is um, like linguistics and its various branches but today we get to know about uh, it deeply and also uh, many are familiar already but it doesn't matter you are recalling uh, some things but when you come for uh, like avoid the influence of mother tongue as I told first start with the rule of pronouncing a word correctly. So we people tend to imitate our surroundings. 
right? So it is a human nature. So how in olden day uh, age, like for example, a Stone Age man as imitated animal sound or be it any bird sound, they do like that. They don't speak language. And that is what is resulting nowadays in a language. So for avoiding mother tongue, I would suggest you to imitate uh, as such like a native speaker. Try and practice makes a man perfect. There is a very good cut. So when you want to avoid a mother tongue, uh, you can talk in your mother tongue in a home. Now, when you talk mother tongue, you don't uh, bring influence of any other language in the world. You will not bring any kind of uh, language. It's a similar way if you learn English or any other language. You don't bring influence of any other language to yours because each language is unique and it should be spoken in a unique way. So if it is English, uh, learn and practice the each word. That is what sound matters most. Because in, uh, if you learn and thorough with the phonetics, all the 44 sounds in English, then I'm pretty sure that you can uh, avoid mother tongue, uh, the pronunciation difference. So as I told you a uh, word already, psychology, there is a P in the first letter. Sorry, first uh, uh, particular in the word you have, uh, in the very first, you have P sound, but you don't pronounce that, you drop that. So when you learn some of the um, important things like this, sure, it can uh, not influence them in your mother tongue uh, by mixing both the mother tongue and in English or whatever the language you speak. So each has its own uniqueness. First, go through with the sound. Now, a Chinese speaker, it is a tonal language, actually, the Chinese. So when you uh, mispronounce the sound, the word itself becomes different. So but in English, thank God, we don't have such things. Only with the word we have uh, when we uh, like we ambiguate the things and ambiguate the words, uh, we have some difference um, uh, like misinterpretations and misunderstandings. But as he asked, mother tongue indifference, as you speak mother tongue in a unique way, try to learn other languages in a unique way. So that is the thing. All right. Thank you very much for your uh, yeah. comprehensive answer. Uh, now we have this question, uh, which is also a big misconception regarding uh, linguistics itself. So many people think that uh, linguistic may just uh, cover English language in general. So mm -hmm. what about other languages? So uh, regarding this, Maria asked, does linguistics only cover English language in general? Uh, because most of the theories in linguistics taught in most of the schools focuses on English, English language. So this also I have answered to the very initial of the presentation, like um, English language is um, not, we are not depending upon English language alone in linguistics, but we learn all human languages in general. So since it is an international language, maybe like uh, because most of the theories and the linguists you find are uh, going with the English language. But also when we focus on other countries, there are also the people who focus um, uh, in their mother tongue. They study in the mother tongue. And uh, for example, I can say last webinar was on Dobri, right? So Dobri is a kind of thing that was what uh, ma'am uh, Devena has taught and she said about a particular language but not an English language. Similarly, if you uh, want to be a linguist in any other language, yeah, sure you can apply your own mother tongue there and not only English but we can study a lot and lot of languages uh, which is in various parts of the world. Okay, thank you for clarifying this. Uh, yeah, pleasure. Uh, and other question that is also misconception. Most of the time, students think linguistics only deal with grammar or grammar is the linguistics. So what's the relation or what's the difference between these two? Yeah, it's also a very good question, uh, Salman, right? So what is the relation between the grammar and linguistics? As I told at the last slide, we can uh, know that the syntax, right? So without that particular structure of a language, you know, there will be also a misconceptions uh, where uh, if you um, take a grammar now subject, a student have to know whether the subject is what and verb and object. So there are a lot of things apart from this for a better understanding for right now, I'll tell you, like uh, for subject, when you misplace, as I told, she likes tree and tree she likes 
this can be depending upon um, a lot of uh, important language which they use all right so now grammar parts uh, uh, play an important role because if you don't know what is verb and if you don't know what is noun and if you misplace and speak that will be like no it will be messing up with english but does not the case is similar in every language the grammar parts can also be different in each and every language because when in place you have to put the subject there you have to use the subject but instead you can't use verb but for the place of verb or object in some other language, you have to use in that place. So that's how the grammar part plays an important role in linguistics. Also, um, linguistics is not only about grammar, but also first basic thing is sound. All right. And then a word. And then it comes like a, a new discovery of word. And after that word becomes a uh, sentence with whereas the meaning is very important for it and for a structure for um, a sentence formation we need grammar which is unique for each language in the country so that is how it is all right so now we have another question uh, do every language has its own grammar yeah, I uh, guess. So this is, I'm not pretty sure, but yes, each language has its own grammar. That is how I showed you in linguistics, like uh, the last slide syntax. So uh, the case with uh, uh, Chinese, we say ni hao ma. So this is Mandarin, where the question is attached ma at the end. But are you good? We ask are, that is a kind of question, or what is your name at the friend, what? So that what is attached in the friend, all right, but for whereas for uh, Chinese kind of languages, we attach the question at the end. So this is how do every language has its own grammar. It's definitely they are. And uh, if you do not uh, misinterpret it and learn in that own style, it will be very easier for grasping any kind of grammar of any language. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we will uh, just now take one last question. Uh, yeah, sure. That is from Shahid Salim. Uh, in English, the normal structure of sentences is subject, verb, and object. All right, but somewhere there are many examples where this is stru this structure is violated. So why is it done? Yes. So basically, for SVO, this is a common sentence, right? So this SVO is um, like a universal sentence, like subject. We have a verb and then an object. So if you uh, do it in English, it is good. But same thing is not applicable for all the language as I showed you in the last slide, because the same thing does not work with Japanese, all right? So if you hear some different kind of languages, as I told you already, if you are a translator, first understand the meaning, and then you will interpret the particular uh, thing and you will translate into your uh, language which you want, whichever you want. So same as well, if you take this, um, uh, language of SVO, or sometimes you can also add complement sentence to the friend, and you can also add adjunct to the friends. Like yesterday, I was uh, going to, and so and so. So in certain sentence, yeah, it is applicable. But you're telling that uh, most of the cases they violate this. So this is also a sentence where people sometimes uh, for a Hebrew kind of languages we saw it is ultimately different where three she likes comes. So can we say three? She likes in uh, English. No, not at all. We can't. So same as well. Each of the sentence pattern is completely different from one language to the other. You, when you use the Google Translate, you can know very well. If you want to translate from one language into the other, if you ask, what are you doing? And that will be something different in the other language when you directly translate. So the sentence construction, we can know from this how each differs. So uh, somewhere there are also many examples where the structure is violated. So sometimes for each word, you have to make it an arrangement according. Like for subject, sometimes it will be a subject. Also, you can use word. And uh, as I told you already, yesterday, if this yesterday uh, is um, mentioning the time or the place, like yesterday, if you use in the front, you that particular SVO will not be SVO. It will change. So I want, I can suggest you can be very much uh, clear with the sentence pattern so that uh, you can know how to construct a sentence and they will not have some misunderstanding and uh, you can follow that a sentence pattern, how it should be used. 
All right, uh, ma'am. So after this question, we are now uh, ending this uh, live Q and A session, and then we will move towards the certificate distribution process and all. So before that, I would like to really thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart for joining uh, this session and giving such a wonderful uh, presentation and answering all the questions uh, very uh, effectively, I must say. And uh, your presentation was also very clear as well as your voice is also clear. So thank you very much. Uh, so thank you very much for joining and we really appreciate it. And I can also see the comments that all the people are thanking you. And I will also take your feedback uh, about you from them and then I will share it with you. Yeah, so, sure. Thank you so much, sir. Abbas. And before uh, like leaving the session, uh, I would say that as a founder and a moderator, sir Abbas plays an important role in connecting a lot of people from various parts of the world where everyone can learn very efficiently. And, you know, this is my very first webinar. So it is like a very kind of cool. And even if you have a lot of sessions in the future, I would like to join and have a lot and lot of uh, very interesting participants. And I have learned a lot from you as well, like the piece and piece you have given a lot of examples. So thank you very much once again and have a great time, everyone. So good night. Thank you very much. All right, so now as, uh, all right, let me just set it. Okay, so now we are uh, done with the webinar the presentation and also a very wonderful pre presentation by Mem Ramya. Now we will like to thank all the participants for joining and uh, contributing uh, your, uh, feedbacks and also your questions to this webinar and making it a very successful webinar and thank you very much and now we will be uh, going towards the certificate distribution process so let me just be very clear and that you understand this process uh, efficiently so first of all the need for you to get the certificate is that you must be uh, seeing this live chat on YouTube so if you cannot see the live chat option in the YouTube, then you can email us at linguisticsandpedagogywebinars at gmail.com and you can put in the subject of the email that I cannot see the feedback from me. All right. So within 24 hours, uh, you have to, if you have watched this webinar, uh, you can email us at linguisticsandpedagogywebinars at gmail.com. Let me just also put it on the screen. All right. Okay, so it's on the screen now. Uh, this is our email. If you cannot see the live chat, then you can email us at this uh, email address for the certificate uh, link or feedback form link. All right, but uh, the people who can see the live chat, I will be sharing the link in the live chat. Uh, all right, so you can click on it and fill it. And before you uh, go and fill it. I also want to mention that when you are uh, on the form, then please make sure you write your name with the correct spelling, with the correct capitalization and correct spaces between uh, of words, all right, your first name, middle name or last name, anything, so that it can be uh, copied to the certificate exactly and correctly, all right, so because it is done through a software, so it will not know if uh, it has to capitalize some words or to give spaces to some words. All right. So please make sure and take care of that. All right. So now, without further ado, I will give the feedback form link. So the feedback form link is the is in the comments, uh, and I will also put it on the screen. It will look like this feedback form link, and here is the link. So please go and fill that form. I will also this okay yes. all right so we have the feedback form link in the comments so please go and fill that form and also in that form you can give feedback for me the host and you can also give the feedback form for the resource person that is miss ramia and if you have some questions or queries then she already gave her information for contact and her presentation in the end of the presentation so when the live webinar ends or even uh, now you can like uh, go back to the part of our presentation and you can see our contact information 
All right. So thank you very much again for all of you for joining. And we do have uh, three more webinars scheduled for September. So if you would like to join them, you can also join them as well. And we have uh, we have our page, Linguistics and Pedagogy webinars uh, on Facebook. So we will update about these new webinars over here. So make sure you go and like that page and follow it so you can see when the new webinar is coming. And also, if you want to join our WhatsApp group, then we do have uh, a post regarding it on our page, Facebook page. So you will get a link from there. Or you can even email us uh, about uh, getting this uh, link for the WhatsApp group. All right. So thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, so I can see 17 responses on now 19 responses on the feedback form, 20 and number is increasing. So please make sure you fill that feedback form as soon as possible. And if you have any problem uh, during filling the form, you can also tell me in this uh, live chat. I will try to help you with that. Um, so yes, if you have any questions for me uh, regarding these webinars or anything, you can also uh, type it in live chat. And if you want to go, uh, then you can uh, leave this video as well because after filling the feedback form, there isn't much for you to do. So, yeah, so thank you again for joining. All right, so I hope everyone have got uh, the feedback form link, and the feedback form link will be available for 24 hours. So, if anyone did not get uh, the link in the live chat they can email us at linguistics and pedagogy webinars at gmail.com within 24 hours and we will send them the feedback from me okay thank you uh Yellen. i hope that's the not right pronunciation thank you so much for joining all right abu Bakar, thank you for submitting the form and okay i will be posting it again here you go now you may be able to see the link in the live chat again i have posted it okay thank you very much thank you claren god bless you too thank you so much for hosting such all right thank you very much everybody. Hope to see you in the next webinar. All right, I will be here with you uh, for three more minutes. So if you have any problem regarding it, you can tell me and I will try to help you with that. Fuad Khan, thank you. Thank you for joining. I hope uh, you benefited from this webinar. And regarding the uh, certificates, I will be updating you on the page when I send all the certificates. And certificates typically take three to four days uh, maximum. So you will be receiving them on your email address, which you will provide in the feedback form. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you for joining. Where is the email address? I'm not sure which email address you are talking about. If you are in uh, the live chat, if you can see the feedback form link, you have to fill that and you will be receiving the certificate. And email address, in case you do not see the live chat or the feedback form link, then you can go to linguistics and pedagogy webinars at gmail.com and email them through Gmail or Yahoo or any other uh, app which you have. You can email us that I did not. Uh, get the feedback from me so I will be sending you over here and uh, thank you so much for joining uh, please clarify if you need uh, my personal email or you need the email of the resource person if you need my email then uh, you can have it like it's Avais Raza Mehman uh, it's my name also. So I wish for the moment at gmail.com and that's my email address if you want that. Thank you.
thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you for joining. So now uh, one minute left and then I will be ending this live session. So we have got 76 responses, 77 responses. So the, the number is increasing. So thank you for filling the form and please fill the form as soon as possible. Uh, thank you, Shna, for joining. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Okay, so my suggestion. Finally, a webinar on world Englishes, post-colonial Englishes as well. Uh, yes, uh, hopefully if we get a resource person for it, uh, we will have a webinar uh, on this topic as well. And if you know someone uh, which might be interested uh, in giving a uh, on conducting a webinar on such topic, then you can also uh, tell them to email us at linguistics and pedagogy webinars at gmail.com. Uh, surely we'll contact them and we will arrange a webinar on this topic. All right. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, R R, for joining. Thank you. Okay, I am receiving a lot of thank yous, so thank you very much. It's really good to have you all and to interact with you. Okay, thank you, Quad. I will be looking uh, towards it. Thanks a lot. It was highly interesting webinar on linguistics. Congratulations. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I'm happy that you have joined. Love and respect. Same for you. Thank you very much. Done filling up. Thank you very much. If you have filled the form, then you can leave this video and you will be receiving your certificates within three to four days maximum. And even before that, it is also possible depending on the number of certificates we have to prepare. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jen. Good night. Thank you, Jamaica, for joining. OK, thank you, Ati, for filling the form. Uh, as I already mentioned that everyone will be receiving your uh, certificates within three to four days. And again, thank you all for joining this session. Uh, now I will be ending the live chat. And again, thank you everyone. And if you could not find the feedback form link or the live chat or you had any problem, uh, so then please make sure uh, to email us at linguistics and pedagogy webinars at gmail.com it's also given here so you can email us uh, you can put in the subject that we want uh, feedback from link so i will be sending that link to you in reply and only the people who fill the feedback form are eligible to receive the certificates so make sure you fill the feedback form Is it necessary to fill the form with the same name as we used here? No, it's not necessary. For example, many people uh, use uh, or put the names on their Gmail IDs different from their real names. Like, uh, for example, somebody had the name with RR. So that's not a real name. So in that case, you can put your real name, like the name which you want on the certificate. So just don't do it for your friends and put their name on it. Put your real name on it and that's all the name which you put on the form and the certificate will be also with that name all right so i hope it's clear so are you a resource person no not in this webinar in this webinar i'm a moderator or you may call a host uh, miss ramia was resource person for this webinar but if i am conducting some webinar or if i am invited in some webinar which I once was, then I can become a resource person. You can also be one, or anyone can be a resource person if he is present in the webinar. Okay, so 
Miss A, thank you. Thank you very much for joining. All right. So now it's time for me to end this live broadcast. So thank you again, everyone, for joining and being here with us and giving your time. I hope you learned a lot. And I hope you will also join our webinars, which we will be arranging in uh, September. So again, thank you very much. And have a good day or have a good night. All right. Thank you very much.